Thank you. Um, I'm from the uh, math department at uh, Arizona State. Um, I was hoping to come here and learn uh, some physics that would help improve my modeling. So far, it has been excellent. Uh, here are uh, several references related to the work I'm going to be talking about today, primarily the uh, latter two here. So uh, just to give a broad overview of the types of problems I'm interested in, they're mostly uh, signal reconstruction uh, for electromagnetic fields. Uh, that means in this case my governing equations are Maxwell's equations and they're actually linear, which is unlike what most of, most of what we've seen today. So the uh, very general question, under what conditions can electromagnetic waves be reconstructed from noisy vector time series? Uh, here I'm considering a time series to be the uh, of the electric field at some fixed location S in my domain. And the question is, can we reconstruct the electric field on some larger domain or just alternatively at some other location? Uh, this will of course depend on boundary conditions and uh, this is not the primary focus of this talk. Instead, I'm mostly going to be talking about the second question. Given that we can reconstruct under certain conditions that I will explain, um, how well can I reconstruct the electric field? Uh, in this case, I mean uh, mean squared error. So the governing equation is going to be uh, the Maxwell vector wave equation, which you can get from Maxwell's equations. I'm going to be considering... Um, stochastic component in my model, and also uh, inhomogeneities, meaning that, uh, in, in this case, the permittivity and permeability depend on space, so they depend on x. And I can take uh, Faraday's law and Ampere's law and combine them, take some derivatives, and we get this third equation here, uh, Maxwell vector wave equation. This is like a vector wave equation, but it has, uh, instead of this little plus operator, it has this Second term, which is the curl squared operator, so curl mu to the minus one curl, and then our forcing on the right hand side is minus dj dt, where j is the current density. From the solution, uh, the electric field E, I get the time series r sub s of t, which is that electric field evaluated at some location s. So uh, just to give a general overview of the problem, I'm going to talk about first the uh, deterministic aspects, and then I'll talk about the stochastic aspects that I'm interested in. So the deterministic aspects are related to this curl squared operator. So instead of looking at the Laplace operator, like in the wave equation, we have this curl mu to the minus one curl. And this will be the uh, operator whose eigenvalues you want when you solve for the electric field. To give a, an idea of what the solutions look like, what the eigenfunctions look like, you can pick a simple example of a periodic medium with the simplest case of just constant coefficients. We see that the eigenfunctions are plane waves, e to the i, k, x, with uh, vector coefficients that are constant, v, k, j, and the v, k, j's are obtained from this uh, matrix. Uh, they're eigenvectors of this matrix, which is just k cross. Um, two of the vectors correspond to uh, transverse waves, so they're orthogonal to the direction of propagation, and then the third is the wave vector k itself, and those are, of course, longitudinal waves. Okay, there's a, uh, some other four ways you could write the same equation, and we can also use some additional information from Maxwell's equations. Uh, firstly, we can use this uh, identity uh, that the curl squared is gradient of the divergence minus little plus in the case where uh, mu is constant. So then in this case, only the permeability or the permittivity is variable. In this case, we can rewrite the Maxwell vector wave equation as equation one here, where I've now replaced uh, the permittivity with this C squared um, because we can combine it with mu uh, and that's the wave speed. Another way we could rewrite it or use some additional information is using Gauss's law. In this case, we don't get the wave equation because the electric field is not divergence free. Instead, uh, right, Gauss's law would say that uh, the divergence of D is zero uh, if we have no charge density. 
Then, we, from this, we could solve for the electric field, um, the, sorry, the divergence of the electric field, which we can substitute into equation one, into the uh, third term of equation one. And that gives us an alternate form, equation two, where now this third term, which is not zero, and, dif and which differentiates this equation from the wave equation, is the gradient of gamma dot E, where gamma is this parameter uh, gradient of the permittivity divided by the permittivity. This is also the uh, gradient of the log of the refractive index. So that's this important parameter that tells you how the uh, electric field components couple. So then here's an example of that uh, in more detail. We can look at uh, just the case of a stratified medium. So this means the permittivity or the refractive index only depends on uh, the x direction, in this case, so I'll consider vertical stratification. That means that this gamma parameter only, uh, is only non-zero in the third component, and that decouples the last component, uh, of our equation, the maximum vector wave equation, equation five here, and that can be solved separately from the first two equations. So that equation is different from, uh, just the standard wave equation with a Laplace operator. So you can solve that. And then this E3, uh, E3 component can be plugged into uh, equations three and four as a forcing term for now just standard wave equations. Okay, so we can look at that uh, third component and what uh, eigenfunctions we get from that, com that uh, last equation. Um, the eigenfunction problem we want to solve is equation six here. So it's not just the Laplace operator. It has this additional term, as I mentioned. And we can further break up this uh, eigenvalue problem by looking at the third component, or the uh, component that depends on x3. And that can be solved, for example, by approximating uh, using the WKB approximation. This just shows us roughly what the uh, eigenfunctions would look like, uh, namely they, they have this uh, epsilon to the minus one half term out front, and also instead of e to the i kx, we have e to the i integral k. Okay, so that's the deterministic part. Now I'm going to talk about the stochastic components. So there are a lot of, there are a number of stochastic Maxwell's equations. I'm just listing a, a few here in uh, two different uh, types. So first we have some uh, random media. The um, maybe a uh, roughly first principles approach would be to consider the um, properties of scattering off of a, a single particle and then summing together the, uh, the scattering of random distribution of those particles. And that's a single scattering theory. but of course, that will ignore secondary effects. So to study beyond that, you would need multiple scattering theory. There is also a model of a random or stochastic refractive index or permittivity. And then, of course, random interfaces where the uh, interface through which a wave propagates is um, randomly distributed. On the other side, we could also um, have a stochastic forcing term, so a stochastic right-hand side by having a stochastic current density. Uh, popular, uh, well-known model is fluctuational electrodynamics, wherein thermal fluctuations correspond to um, dissipation in the system. So I'm going to talk about this last one a little more. So in this case, uh, for this last model, which is fluctuational electrodynamics, the current density is broken up into Ohm's law, so this sigma e, which is the dissipation component, and a fluctuating component, j sub f, which is a, uh, the stochastic component. And we can obtain a relation between the dissipation and the uh, fluctuations, which tells us how, uh, how to model the stochasticity by using the pointing theorem and getting an energy balance. So equation seven is the pointing theorem and under some uh, simplifying 
under, under some uh, assumptions here of uh, stationarity and uh, our fields, our electric field and magnetic fields being complete, we can set the, uh, we actually have the first and last terms of equation seven are zero. Uh, the last term because it's a complete field, so it's zero outside of some region. And the first term because the uh, fields are stationary. This means that the only non-zero term in the pointing theorem is this middle term here, which is the integral of j dot e. But j is sigma e plus jf. And so we can plug that in after taking the ensemble average and get equation eight here. And this relates the dissipation, which is the uh, component on the left side, to the uh, fluctuations of the current density on the right side. This tells you uh, how to model the covariance of the current density, which is given in this last equation here, and this is just the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this tells us that the, uh, the fluctuations in the current density are directly related to this sigma, which is the um, imaginary component of our uh, permittivity. Of course, then also the rest of the model is that the uh, components of the current density are uncorrelated and uh, uncorrelated in space as well. Okay, so going back to my model, I'm going to talk about um, the... Uh, I'm going to talk about my model now. So the Maxwell vector wave equation, as I'd mentioned earlier, I'm considering uh, stochastic current density in a more mathematical sense where we consider a cylindrical Wiener process to represent our current density to make it stochastic. So this means that our current density is the square root Q dw dt, where w is the cylindrical Wiener process. This means that we can uh, decompose this uh, stochastic current density into a sum of dw dt, sigma n, and then some weight epsilon times phi n, where phi n are eigenfunctions. And to make this uh, term well behaved, the uh, operator q is a trace class operator, which forces the sum of the squares of the sigmas here to be finite. I should note that the sigmas here are actually different than the sigmas on the last slide. Um, the, sigmas, the sigma on the last side is the conductivity. Here it is uh, represents the level of noise uh, corresponding to a given component uh, of the uh, current density. So the, in this case, I'm going to consider the eigenfunctions, which correspond to the uh, curl squared eigenvalue problem here, this uh, equation I showed before. And this, in this case, will give us a sequence of ODEs we can solve for uh, in time with uh, force with a uh, stochastic forcing. So notice that this last equation is a harmonic oscillator with stochastic forcing. Okay, so what's nice about this um, uh, problem, uh, unlike probably a lot of the problems that we see at this conference, because everything is linear, you can actually solve for the uh, solution explicitly. And we can now see that the electric field is uh, can be decomposed into uh, signal component, which are these cosine and sine terms, and we also have a stochastic term, which is related to this uh, Wiener process, Wn. I said I'm interested in signal reconstruction, so in this case, I'm interested in reconstructing the signal component of this electric field from time series data that will include the stochastic fluctuations given by this last term. Okay, so... Um, Important thing to note about this model uh, is that it's not um, an equilibrium. So the uh, forcing adds energy to the system, unlike the uh, previous model that I mentioned, uh, given by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So the ANFTs, which were my uh, components in time, which correspond to a particular eigenfunction, the variance actually incre increases roughly linearly. So this is energy being added to the system. Okay, I have my time series, R sub s of t, which includes this noise, and we want to reconstruct just the signal component. 
um, standard time series analysis would tell you to just take this uh, inner product here, uh, which is this time average of my signal against cosine or sine uh, components uh, with respect to a given frequency, square root lambda n, or lambda j. This just gives us a standard approximation of our coefficient, a given coefficient of our signal. I said that I wanted to look at the um, error in these approximations. Error is given by the uh, uh, mean squared error in this case. Sorry, I'm considering mean squared error for a particular coefficient, fj hat. Uh, what's nice about mean squared error in these stochastic problems is that we can we can break apart it in, into the squared bias and the variance, uh, just a standard decomposition of mean squared error. And importantly, here, uh, unlike sometimes in uh, uh, bias variance trade-offs, we can't compute everything explicitly. But in this case, we can explicitly compute the bias and variance term, uh, where the variance term comes from the stochastic uh, current density. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate um, how this works by considering just a, a simple case. Um, we can we can look at the general case at the end, but uh, just to illustrate, we're looking at a two-component electric field. So just these two eigenfunctions, and uh, we are interested in what the MSU looks like. So here is a uh, decomposition of that MSE into bias and variance, which we can compute uh, analytically. So on the left-hand side here, here's the mean squared error. Notice that it initially decays, and that's a result of the bias decaying, and then it slowly increases uh, roughly linearly due to the variance. And again, you can compute this uh, analytically. And on the right-hand side, I've just shown that decomposition into uh, squared bias and variance, uh, which, as I mentioned, the bias decays and the uh, variance grows. Something to note about the bias, however, is that the bias is related to um, the deterministic component of my time series, meaning that the, the error I get in my uh, signal reconstruction in the deterministic case is related to the other components in my signal. So if I have multiple frequencies, uh, the error in the bias is given by the other components in my signal. Okay, um, I'll, for, uh, I'll skip over that for time. So because the bias depends on other terms in our signal, we can't just readily use this uh, minimum MSC that we saw on the plot earlier because we wouldn't know what the other, uh, what, what the bias is because it depends on the other coefficients. So instead we solve for them iteratively um, where we take estimates of the mean squared error and minimize the mean squared error and obtain better estimates of each of the coefficients. Okay, and this is uh, it right here. So here's an example uh, reconstruction using that uh, uh, minimum. Uh, I should know. I don't think I have one, uh, had yet said this, but that minimum here is the uh, optimal observation time. Um, if I can just say one last thing. So I, I did actually prepare um, some optional discussion if uh, if time allows. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I have a, a question. Uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, you, you were having a steady state and you had dissipation. Yeah. So d doesn't the system get hotter and hotter if there's dissipation going on all the time? Um, y well, so in the, uh, go back to it. Are you, are you referring to the, uh, this case? Um, the, so the fluctuation dissipation theorem case? Y yes. Y you're, Left-hand side of equation 10 is the dissipation, mm -hmm. the sigma EE. So that should be heating the system up. That's going on continuously. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, you're going on forever. It should get infinitely hot. Yes. So I'll only be considering this for a finite period of time. 
Yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again.